Dharma Collective. We are fortunate to have Dave Smith with, with us here tonight. And Dave is a um, internationally recognized meditation teacher, a published author and um, addiction treatment specialist. He's done work with um, people behind bars, uh, juvenile detention centers, addiction treatment centers. Um, he founded the Secular Dharma Foundation and uh, are used to teach with Against the Stream Meditation Society as well. And he is here tonight with part two um, of the uh, uh, wisdom, excuse me, the uh, ethics uh, portion of the Eightfold Path, the Sila uh, factors. And I will let him go ahead and get started. Thank you for the good introduction. I appreciate that. No um, so good to see everybody again. Um, yeah, I'm going to dive right in uh, and just say last week, you know, I, you can watch it. I spoke about uh, Sama Vacha, which is about finding our voice. Um, tonight, I'm going to talk about Sama Kamanta, which is uh, usually translated as right action, but I'm going to push back against that and really talk about um, it more about doing our work or finding our calling or doing a vocation. And then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about right livelihood because I'm gonna talk about that next week. So I, I do need to talk about all three a little bit, but tonight we're gonna focus on um, right action as it's technically called. Uh, but to just zoom out again, as I like to do, I think it's helpful if we get a sense of the historic Buddha and the time in the world that he lived in um in ancient india and just just to know that it was a very interesting time because he grew up in a culture as he grew up and as he was teaching the world that he lived in was going from very much of a farming agricultural kind of tribal lifestyle and, and throughout his lifetime uh cities began to emerge commerce began to emerge things like money became to became uh, started to emerge and the idea of leaving you know the idea that he's leaving home for homelessness a lot of times is about leaving you know your your rural home and go, going to the city like a lot of us do now if we go off to college or we go off to another place into the world the, it, it was kind of the emergence of cities were happening and i think that really informed his idea in particularly around the teachings on right action so let, let's just talk about right action a little bit um first again I'll, I'll just reiterate this word sama that you see at the beginning of every path factor uh you know which is you know right view right intention right speed right action right livelihood and so on uh it's it really i think we've we've done a disservice to ourselves by using the word right because we're automatically put into a binary now right and wrong and right and wrong is a pretty intense binary um, and so we don't even need to, we can just dump the word, right? Because, you know, we're, this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. I'm a Buddhist teacher. If I'm going to do a talk on, you know, action, you're going to assume, and you should assume I'm going to be talking about it from a Buddhist perspective. So we don't even need that word. Like last week when I talked about right, right speech, I don't need to say right speech. I say, here's some Buddhist perspectives on communication, on finding your voice, right? I think we just, we, we don't even need to be bogged down in that term. But then if you look at the word kamanta, it actually doesn't translate as action. And you all know what word translates as action. It's kama, karma. There's a talk about, I'm not gonna go down the karma road, but what a, what a grossly misunderstood word that is. Karma in Sanskrit, kama in Pali, same word. Uh, and, and so if, if it was sama kama, it would be right action. But what does this word kamanta mean? If you look in the Pali English dictionary, the word kamanta is usually translated as work, business, occupation, vocation, doing, acting, working, business, profession, these kinds of things, which immediately puts me in the goal, well, that must mean right livelihood. But I think we want to just pause on the term I think that does the heavy lifting, which is vocation. Uh, or we would talk about it in a, in a secular sense or in a contemporary sense, uh, your calling. What do you feel moved to do? What do you feel called to do? And, and actually, in some senses, too, a vocation, a calling is oftentimes related to a religion. We, a lot of times when people become a priest in, in Christianity and Catholicism, uh, it's considered a vocation, a vocation of the church, a vocation of God, feeling called to the cloth, as they say. So there's actually, in our English paradigm of thinking of lexicon, there's actually a religious kind of calling built into the idea, which I actually like. 
And so if we look at it from a Dharma perspective, many of us could say we've been called to this practice for a variety of reasons. We heard a podcast, we read a book, we went to a group, we spoke to a friend. And when we do the meditation tonight, I'll actually ask you to reflect on that because I think there's a lot of value in trying to remember when you came into Dharma, when Dharma actually started to make sense to you, where you're like, wow, this is, there's something here. You know, what was going on in your life? What were the conditions of your life? How were you doing? Where were you living? What were you thinking? Were you confused about the world? Were you, most people, let's be honest, come to Dharma because shit ain't worked out. You know, it's kind of like Alcoholics Anonymous. People don't come into their first Dharma group, generally speaking, because they're thriving. There's usually some degree of dissatisfaction or some degree of suffering. They're like, well, maybe Buddhism will help me. Or maybe, and usually a lot of times it's mindfulness. Maybe mind, I need mindfulness. I, I need to meditate. You know, that's usually what calls us in. That's what was my, my situation was, was that calling. Now, if you, if you hear what I'm saying right now, you probably normally wouldn't think of what I'm talking about as a kind of right action thing. You wouldn't make that assumption. But I think that's the right assumption to make, because also, if we look at the word vocation, there's a strong correlation with the word voice, calling. Uh, in fact, there's a really great teacher. Uh, I had to read a book. I was, I was trained by uh, Eve Ekman, who you all know, who I love, is, is one of my dear friends, in her Cultivating Emotional Balance training. And one of the things I had to do was read a book by someone named Parker Palmer, who also wrote a book called The Voice and the Vocation which is a really great book about, about everything I'm talking about. It's like, it's interesting to me that voice is rooted in the word vocation. I spoke about that last week. So if we look at it from a more secular sense, a more contemporary sense, and we get out of this right and wrong in this kind of way in which Buddhism leans us into the monastery, as we find our voice, as we find a calling, we feel called to do something. A lot of the things that we get called to do is to liberate ourselves from suffering. And that's really what the whole Dharma path is about. And um, so I said this last week, but I, I believe, and there's a, a lot of evidence, and there's a lot of people who also believe that there were two Dharma paths at the time of the Buddha. Because at the time of the Buddha, as I'm saying, a lot of people were becoming professionals. People were, they weren't just farmers anymore. There were farmers, there were, there were butchers, there were people making arrows, there were potters, there were woodworkers, there were people making stuff out of leather. There was people who were getting into kind of business, making products, selling the products, trading the products. I'll trade you this for that. I'll trade you some rope for some, some of that. You know? And so a lot of these people, artisans, they're oftentimes called in the early canon, a non-monastic people who really took the Buddha's instructions very seriously who really were in the cultivation of this eightfold path. And so if that was the case, then these other kind of more historical, um, I'll send it to you at the end, Claudia, um, would have been more relevant for those kinds of folks about really trying to find, what do you feel called to do? You know, a lot of people, you know, do find that people want to become a nurse, they want to become a doctor, they want to become a teacher. But some of us, we, we live our whole lives and we're just totally confused. We don't know what the hell we want to do. And so that's okay. But I think when you when you think about vocation from a Dharma perspective, it's really more about what you're doing internally than about what it is you're actually doing in the world. Now, the two might be connected, and they might be very well connected, and they might be very well aligned, and that's fine and good, and, and actually, that's been my experience, and I, I'm really happy about that. But even if they're disjoined, if they're not so aligned, that's okay, too. So the, the, the term for liberation that you see that's more on this non-monastic side, and I would use the word secular for this world, because we live in the secular world, uh, and is... Um, Chitta Vimuti, the word for liberation is Vimuti. Uh, Chitta Vimuti is to liberate ourselves through, through uh, our hearts, through our heart minds, and really through our behaviors, through uh, what are called beautiful behaviors. And, you know, speak, talking, communication, voice uh, can be a very, very beautiful behavior. I mean, how many beautiful conversations have you had with people over the course of your life, right? So 
do we think about that and do we pay attention in that way? And how many beautiful behaviors are there through the actions that we take, the things that we do? Now, the reason I use the word beautiful, this is something that's always confused me and I was thinking about it today because I knew I had to teach this tonight. There's a, another, there's a part of the Theravada tradition is one of the later uh, aspects of the Pali Canon, which is known as the Abhidharma, which is a little bit controversial because it came much later. I've been studying, I actually really like the Abhidharma or most of it. And in the Abhidharma, the, 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 the writers of the Abhidharma, what they did is they took the mind or they took chitta, which is normally known as sort of greed, hatred, and confusion, and we want to overcome those, right? That's the liberation. We liberate ourselves from greed, hatred, and confusion. But they unpack it a little bit further, and they break it down into 52 mental factors. And they say there's there's universal mental factors, there's ethically neutral mental factors, there's destructive mental factors, and there's beautiful mental factors. The good news is of 52, 26 are beautiful mental factors. And the last three are called, and I never really taught this until now, because I, I always just thought they just put it in there to try to make the Eightfold Path more relevant, but I don't think so anymore. And they're called the abstinences, as an abstinence, as an abstaining from something. And they are, they are right speech, right action, and right livelihood. And so they're really, if we're going to really liberate ourselves, part of liberating ourselves is about finding our voice, finding our work and then doing our work and then having to navigate surviving in this world knowing that there's going to be a monetary dukkha a monetary challenge we're going to have monetary conditions that we're going to have to deal with we're going to have to negotiate because i don't have a monastery or an organization or a religious institution that pays me a salary you know uh, and most Western Dharma teachers, in fact, I'm very grateful. Honestly, I think I'm one of the few Dharma teachers who actually is able to just Dharma teach and actually pull it off, um, even though I do some clinical stuff. So when we think about it along these lines, a lot of times we would think vocation or the profession or business is really about kind of the livelihood piece. But I think we need to kind of move that back a little bit and try to figure out what our work is. So, you know, ultimately, we, like if we could look, you know, and part of the teachings here are the five precepts, right? This is kind of, when you hear a Dharma talk on the right action, you hear a Dharma talk on the five precepts. And if you, that's pretty much all you get. Uh, you won't hear much other than that, which I have nothing against the five precepts. I actually want to talk about those a little bit because I think that they're un misunderstood to some degree. The five precepts are things that were being so in the abhidharma right action is an abstinence so there's a kind of intentionality of like here's some kind of behaviors that aren't so great that you want to avoid and that's really what the 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 precepts are just a mindfulness practice they're just a training ground they're not like here's the they're not the ten commandments of the dharma which is usually how they're kind of brought down thou shalt not you know the, the, the idea of thou shalt not is really kind of burnt into those ideas so i just kind of want to go through these a bit and uh, understand why they're called abstinences and the first and obvious one is um usually it's associated with not killing and then you know you get in the good buddhists who they don't kill bugs or they start getting really kind of weird around that kind of stuff which is fine i mean i actually uh I live out in the country. There's lots of things I actually kill. I have to kill. You know, we, we just live that place. We have prairie dogs out here that cause all kinds of problems. And, you know, and so, you know, I don't, and also I don't feel like I really practice the first precept because I eat meat. You know, I think that the first precept uh, is calling for vegetarianism, you know, because it's about not, it's about protecting life and it's not about harming life. And it's a practice. And I think it's a lot better if we just be honest about that. Because I've heard many, many Dharma teachers and many Buddhists kind of justify eating meat through some kind of, you know, psychological gymnastics about why it's okay. And I just feel more comfortable saying, like, I don't really totally practice the first precept because I eat meat and I kill prairie dogs and I step on bugs and I kill, you know, creatures sometimes because it's just what I have to do. We have we have mice in our house and I can't have mice in my house, so I have to catch them and, and that's just how that goes. But I, but having said all that, I still really value life and I do try to protect life as much as I can. Knowing that it's not a binary, either I totally never do it 
you know, there, it, 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 there, 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 we have to be a little bit more sophisticated in how we acclimate towards that precept. So it's just trying to protect life more, trying to really not cause harm, you know, intentional harm. And so that, that's a practice that we take on and we, and we do the best we can. It's not either right or wrong. I'm either doing it right or I'm not doing it right. But we have to, and the thing about it that really what it's helping us to liberate ourselves from, it's not whether we kill bugs or don't kill bugs. That's just misses the point. It's about overcoming hatred. You know, if we're trying to liberate ourselves from greed, hatred, and confusion, most of the time when we harm another being, it's out of hatred. So sometimes we have to maybe harm, like, like I don't eat meat out of hatred. You know, I don't catch mice and out of hatred. I, you know, it's part of a, a, another aspect of survival. So part of it is like, I try to be harmless in my actions. I try to protect life as much as I can. And I try to live a harmless, you know, I try to have a less of a carbon footprint. I don't try to do it perfectly. I just try to be honest about how I acclimate towards that. And it's a practice um, that I take very seriously. And it's really about liberating myself from hatred. It's about respecting life, even the life uh, of the creatures I end up, you know, taking their lives. Um, it's really about uprooting that hatred. And I think we need to look at it more from that perspective. Um, n you know, not taking taking what's not freely offered, right? That's another precept we try not, and, and that's a lot more than stealing. Uh, there's lots of things we can try to take that are not freely offered. Other people's time, other people's attention, information from people that they have that we try to get out of them because we want even though we have no business getting it we, we we find ourselves often trying to get things or take things or acquire things that are not being freely offered that's what it's about it's not about stealing it's about how do we uh try to acquire anything it's not just goods and services and monetary material i don't it's also people's attention uh people's affection people's interest you know we we're, we're, we're there's lots of taking that goes on and that's about that's about liberating ourselves from greed from wanting something that's not being given that's greed and so we we try to abstain from that you know and, and we're not we're not going to do it perfectly but we just kind of want to watch how we do that you know a lot of times it's gossip around people like you know somebody knows something about somebody and you want to know what they know about somebody so we try come on tell me what did she say what they do a lot of times you know that that's the same thing they're, they're, that's not being freely offered that information and we, we try to get it it's about overcoming ourselves from greed and then interesting enough the next precept is on speech so i already talked about that right we try to be you know we try to uh abstain from using our voice in ways that are divisive that are harmful that are dishonest you know and we do our best but we have to see that as actually a practice um and, and so i feel much more authentic to say that i really feel like i i take the precept on um not taking things that are freely offered very seriously also the precept on speech very very seriously and then the other, the next precept that I think oftentimes misunderstood, it's usually about sexuality. We try to, you know, we try to refrain from, we try to be careful with our sexuality, which can mean a whole range of things to a whole range of people. You know, what one person deems careful and what another person deems careful might be very different. And it's definitely about, sexuality is certainly part of it, but it's actually really about sensuality. In, in, the, in the early canon, it's about your senses. It's about actually the way that we uh, are greedy for pleasant. Uh, it's about eating too much food, watching too much TV, like uh, listening to too much, you know, news. It's about guarding your senses. It's, a, it's an abstinence or a renunciation or a restraint of sensory pleasure, which part of that, of course, is sexuality. That's a strong gripping part of it. But I think when we just reduce it to sexuality, we're missing out. You know, it's about overcoming greed again, you know, gluttony. It's about overcoming delusion and confusion about, you know, we we engage in sense and, you know, we, we become uh, overly distracted and we, we, we try to pry so much pleasure and happiness out of sensory items that they're never going to provide that for you. 
They're never going to provide that temporary sense of satisfaction, which is what the world tells us they would do. And we become, we live on that sort of hedonic treadmill. You know, so it, it's a restraint of 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 of, of the phone, of, of the media, of the Facebook, of the it's all of that. Is that that precept? You know, and, and sexuality is certainly included in there, but it's so much more than that. It's about sensory pleasure and grasping and clinging and 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 being and, and thinking that everything we need is gonna come through the senses. Um, which most people live their whole lives doing that. Um, the last one, which is another controversial one, uh, is around um, intoxicants. Um, you know, the Buddha says, you know, you should restrain from clouding the mind, which I'm in recovery, so it's easy for me to say I practice this one because, A, I do. And, like, you know, um, I also feel like I have a bias. I'll, I'll, I'll admit that I have a bias. I believe that... The, the practice of the fifth precept is really about sobriety. It's about not engaging in any form. And of course, people like to, uh, this is the other thing too, like as, as a non-vegetarian and as somebody who does take life, I am happy to admit and to say, I don't really fully believe that I practiced the first precept. I'd rather say that than to make some excuse. But I think the Dharma world is very, very keen on making excuses for having a glass of wine or smoking a little bit of weed. Or nowadays, the ayahuasca, the, the plant medicine movement, which is really getting intermingled with Dharma, which I, I you know, uh, again, I have a bias towards that as a guy in recovery. But I, you know, mixing intoxicants in Dharma practice just to me seems very, very uh, suspicious. I, I don't really, I don't, I can't really wrap my head around that. And I, and I have friends and colleagues who I love and respect who participate in those ceremonies. And I, I get it, you know, like I don't have a judgment, but I just think that the mind is so confused and deluded in and of itself that tampering with the as the Tibetan Buddhists call it, our sense of pristine awareness through altering the aggregate of perception, which is what you do when you take any sort of mind altering substance, you take that aggregate, one of the five aggregates of perceiving and you're altering its dimensions. And so the information that you're taking in or the things that are happening may be beneficial, maybe not beneficial, but I don't, I don't believe that there's a whole lot there in terms of actual liberation. Um, and for some people, maybe, maybe, maybe it is. So this is, I just want to really clarify that this is really my opinion more so than anything else. Um, and other people probably have other ones. So, um, those are definitely part of, of our Dharma work. Um, but, uh, they're training aspects. They're part of it. And there's, there's just a lot more here. Um, so I want to do a practice in a few minutes, but the, the, but lastly, I'll say, and I'll continue this after we practice, where I kind of want to go and end with this is, having said all of that, I think what we're being asked to do is to actually figure out what our work is here. You know, what, you know, you have, you were born into this body, you were born into this world, you, you have the parents you have, you have the conditioning, you have your conditions in which you have to live in. We're all navigating our own conditions and our, our conditions are insanely different. There's certainly universal overlaps, right? No doubt. And that's why I think Dharma is so good because it does really bring us into the universal. I think the Buddha, the most brilliant kind of, uh, what's the word, thing that he left behind, his, the legacy of his Dharma is the way that he systemized the mind's operating system and just gave us so much direction and so much useful purpose. But, you know, you have to do all of the stuff. You have to drive the ship, you know, you have to navigate the vehicle. You have to, you know, so the idea of uh, the, the Buddha gave us a great map. Um, but there's no such thing as a perfect map. You know, there's a useful map. Some maps are useful, some maps aren't useful. But he gave us a great map that he's asking us to say, here's a great map. Now let's see if you can use this map to help navigate the territory of your lived experience 
for the benefit of yourself and for the benefit of everyone. You know, and are you interested and willing to take that on and to liberate yourself through through practice of meditation, through understanding uh, the limitations of this human experience, the possibilities of the experience, and to liberate yourself through developing, engaging, and living in beautiful behavior through how you talk and how you communicate and how you work and how you act and how you find a calling in your life. And then also having to deal with, which I'll talk about next week, a survival. How do you, how do you do all of that stuff and fucking pay the rent? And how do you do that ethically? And you know, that, that, that's a lot right there. I think for most of us, that's largely what we're up against as we kind of negotiate after having a Dharma practice. And if we reduce it to the 20 minutes that we sit on the cushion every day or whatever, or the one retreat we get to, man, we're just missing out on so much. So much practice, so much opportunity. So I think part of the, um, and this also to why it well, part of the, the Secular Dharma Foundation, the way that I bring secular practices, I think there's a, a dimension when part of part of doing our work and finding out our work, I think there's a dimension of sort of uh, for lack of a word, clinical, therapeutic offerings that our world has that really help us do that. Like, you know, like when you go to therapy or you talk to clinical people, it's all about doing your work. You know, we got to do the work. In recovery, we got to do the work. And part of doing the work is knowing what the work is and knowing what your unique work is. And, um, and kind of you have to figure out the puzzle of you. You know, as the Zens call it, the Zen koan, you know, the kind of the puzzle. I think a lot of what we're trying to do here is try to figure out what's our puzzle. How do I make sense of this Dave Smith experience that I've been in for almost five decades? How's this project going? You know, it's like, I, I, I got a lot of the, and I got the corners in, you know, I got a lot of the puzzle put pretty well together. I feel pretty, feel pretty happy about how much of the puzzle I got sorted out, but there's definitely some big gaping holes, right? And I, that's okay. I'm okay with that. And of course, the, the goal is to complete the puzzle and see the complete picture. And then really, I think right view, as we talk about the first path factor, I think that comes away at the end. I think that's when we really see the puzzle. We see, as the Gestalt therapists say, we see the complete picture. We see the whole picture. You know, we see our life for the tragedy and the beauty that it is. And we see that we're in the shared humanity of this tragedy and this beauty. And it's like framing that up. Um, and, you know, I think meditation and ethics is really how you do that. It's how you build that out. So the idea that right view is the first path factor never really made sense to me. You know? I actually believe that right view is a very rare moment and I'm not in it much. Once in a while, I feel like I get, I'm like, okay, I think I'm seeing things pretty clearly right now, but most of the time, no way. So I think what we'll do, this will be maybe an odd guided practice, but I'm gonna do it anyway. It's not a traditional practice. Um, but uh, because there's just a few of us here, we can maybe have some interesting dialogue about this. Um, and maybe we'll do this for about uh, 20 minutes or so. Um, it's just doing some investigation and in, in some insight practice and in in, some of you probably already know, but trying to get a sense of what your work is. And, and I think one of the, one of the big things they talk about in Buddhism is just, uh, we're trying to overcome ignorance through wisdom, but I think ignorance is really the wrong word. I think it's denial is the better word because I, I know that there's some stuff I'm in denial about. I think there's always some stuff that we're in denial about. And I think part of doing our work is trying to, to get below that, like, you know, I need to really break through the, the ignorance being I'm ignoring. What am I ignoring? What do I know is true about myself or true about my experience? I just, I'm just kind of ignoring. And that's really what denial is. It's a kind of uh, built-in system that we don't really want to go and look at that stuff. So this practice will include some compassion because I think compassion is crucial here. And uh, I'll just, that's all I'll say about that and I'll walk you through it so you can find a comfortable, upright way to sit. And I'll start and let's end with the bell.
And so just taking a few moments to allow yourself to unhook from being on screen and coming into your home, which we have the luxury of being able to meet together, but at home. And just bringing a simple awareness into your body, into your sensing experience. And seeing if you can allow yourself to become attuned or to be connected with the rising and falling of your in and out breathing. And breathing here with the whole body, not just one part of the body, but the body breathing in, the body breathing out. Mindfulness of breathing. Developing a simple awareness. Developing a kind awareness, a friendly attitude of benevolence towards yourself. And just holding that space for the next few minutes. And as you become more tuned and more present with your body, puts you more in touch with your heart. And as you breathe in and out to just see if you can sense into or feel into or recognize your own wish or your own desire to be free. or to be at ease, or to be liberated, or to be awake, whatever term resonates with you, to just see if you can access your wish, your desire for that. This is your Dharma door, your calling to this practice. See if you can just touch into that. And then see if you can bring to mind or recall 
your first introduction or your first initial interest or calling to Dharma practice, whether it was through mindfulness, through a friend, through something that you read. See if you can just investigate your mind and body and just see if you can get in touch with that original door opening. And just continuing to see if you can feel into, touch into that, that original experience that brought you here. And as you kind of become more familiar, however you can, with this sense of desire for freedom, the original calling, this word vocation is a kind of calling towards something other than what we've been taught or learned, this kind of deeper sense of meaning and purpose. a deeper appreciation for just the quality of this mind and this body and this heart, the potential. And just in your own way, recognizing the way in which you're doing this work of freeing yourself from that which just does not serve you. And part of doing this work here in this practice is to just begin to recognize or to touch into what is it that you wish to let go of? What do you wish to be free from? You can even say that through phrases internally, may I be free of my self-judgment. 
May I be free of my contempt towards others. May I be free of the ways I indulge in sensory pleasure. May I be free from any of the harm that I cause myself through my thoughts, through my speech, through my actions. And if you can, see if you can sense into that which you most wish to be free from. And see if you can just practice letting go of that for now. As an act of sila, goodness for oneself, for yourself, here and now.
And then just coming into your direct experience, into your body, heart, mind. And to also recognize what is it that you would like to cultivate? Not just what would you like to let go of, what would you like to be free from, but what would you like to be free to? Sense of kindness, awareness, generosity. What would you like to cultivate? What are some things, what are some work that you would like to do? So part of this reflection is to reflect on that in which we want to let go of because it no longer serves us. And what is it we wish to cultivate because it does serve us? And just practicing with that on your own silence for the last few minutes of this practice. All right, thank you very much for your practice this evening. So, uh, love to. Uh, we had some great discussion last week. I would be very uh, happy and curious to see what questions you have about this presentation of these path factors, these core Buddhist practices. Nothing you know, very, very much core Dharma, uh, or just about the practice we did. Or really, anything you want to ask or say, we have we have some time for that. So. You should be able to just unmute yourself and speak on up if you wish. Thank you.
It's always hard to get that first one. Oh, heck, I'll go. Okay. Oh, did somebody that? else start talking? You go in. Go, go in, please. Oh, okay. We have plenty well, of time. I, I just wanted to say that just this evening, I was having this discussion with a couple of, um, of a Dharma friends about vocation, you know, right livelihood. We were talking about Sila and how it relates to the practice. And um, it, it's, it's interesting how we try um, to make those connections you talked about, Dave, about how, how we have to pull apart having to make a living at the same time as trying to follow the path. And I think that's, that's a big struggle um, for a lot of people. Personally, I'm just about to retire. So that question is just about, is about gone as far as the right you know, livelihood. But I, 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 do, I do have a struggle with vocation. So um, I wanted to thank you for this practice. I'm not sure I have an actual question other than if you, if you have some other um, you know, resources on this, this topic of um, you know, vocation in particular, um, that would be really helpful. And I also wanted to commend you for this, these talks. I think that we in the West are missing the boat by not spending a lot of time on the other, the other factors of the path, because I personally, this is where all of my progress is made is, is, is in this area. So um, personally, I feel like it's underrated by, by a large uh, uh, amount. So thank you. And I guess I don't have a question, but thank you. No, I, I appreciate that. Everything you're saying is basically music to my ears. So I appreciate the reflection back. And I'm always happy to hear that. I think that you're right. I think that largely in our culture, we have been certainly very meditation mindfulness heavy, very, very heavy. We've been wisdom preoccupied and seal is kind of this like whatever thing. And when you look like if you look to the Buddhist tradition, you know, I, I have yet to come across, this is why I, I pull a lot of the secular stuff, in my, and I've been studying this stuff for a very long time, I don't find much stuff that's actually very helpful in my secular life to help me with speech, action, livelihood. I haven't found Dharma teachings to really do much for me. I find them to be very lean. Um, and, you know, and I spend most of my life talking, acting, and working. That's mostly what I do. And so that's always bothered me. It's always frustrated me, frankly. Yeah, that's really interesting you say that. Um, the the only other, I mean, I was struck by your first talk. I saw it on um, on YouTube, and I was really struck by it. The only other talk that I've that I've ever heard of that kind of had this flavor of including all of the path in your happiness in your in your search, right, is a talk by and a Bayagiri monk, which I found, which I'm happy to to quote cool. into the into the chat, because um, I just found it again. But um, anyway, yeah, I just think we missed that boat, and and it's so valuable to look at how we how we see our search for happiness, and when we focus on one or two things, we may not even be hitting our skill set, and and here we are forcing ourselves, or you know, it could be so simple just to look at. A precept that you're not following or you know it could be so simple and yet we are completely missing it completely or or beating yourself up for a precept that you're not following but you're that, mostly following that's you know true I mean? too right absolutely a failure of compassion right and mm -hmm. and understanding and not and seeing it by the law and not by the right view there's um, a teaching yeah. in the canon that i really like that speaks to this and i i have I have kind of a farm out here, so I have chicken. So the, the, mm -hmm. the Buddha talks about chickens, actually. It's called mm -hmm. the Bhavana Sutta. And he talks about a chicken who has eight eggs. Mm -hmm. And the eight, eight eggs are symbolic for the Eightfold Path. And he says that the, the goal is for all of the eggs to hatch. And so if you want all of the eggs to hatch, you have to be sitting on all of the eggs. You have to be moving the eggs around a little bit. 
and you have you have to be knowing and aware of certain times in your life certain path factors are certain re- are much more relevant at certain times in your life for like certain reasons so part of my practice is knowing what egg do i need to be sitting on and what egg <laughs> I'm sitting on for too long <laughs> what egg do I need to be sitting on? I love it, Dave. Thank you so much. But, I mean, this is like straight out of the canon too. This yeah, is like perfect, the story that Buddha tells about. Perfect. You know, and I have chickens and they do, they, they move them around. There, there's, uh-huh. there's no, the eightfold path, it's not in order. It's just, right. big, it's just eight right. eggs and a messy chicken. Right. Food, man. You gotta, you gotta keep the eggs all the right temperature. So yeah, you gotta move them from outside to inside and I know how chickens do that. That's true. That's and really cool. it takes cool. steady care and attention to pull that off. Mm-hmm. That's right. Oh, that's a perfect, that's a perfect analogy. Perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's no, great. Thank you. I I'm going to use it. that. Yeah. Yeah, Claudia, please. Uh, I just want to thank you so much for uh, also last uh, week's session about voice. Uh, it just kept on resonating. Uh, you know, the being authentic, honest, and yet kind. And I remember about your honey tipped uh, arrow because I have had uh, since then throughout this week. And I, well, let me backtrack a little bit. Uh, when you, we were doing the meditation and you were asking us to think about what brought us to the Dharma, you know, and I came from a pretty traumatic uh, childhood. And I had a lot of anger and resentment mm-hmm. that I still, and grudges that I still work <laughs> with, you know, I mean, two steps forward and one backward or what, whatever. Um, and so I find, and I took CB with Eve also. So I've learned to recognize, oh, yeah, I've learned to recognize um, anger in my body. And, uh, but it, it, it does come <laughs> I have to say, I mean, I still get triggered relatively easily. And I just have to really remind myself, you know, to like breathe deep and, uh, you know, when getting triggered. And I, of course, find that if I calm down, I mean, things can be solved more relatively more easily, you know, but uh, that was so helpful. I mean, your talk last week about, about the voice, about the what samavacha oh. samavacha samavacha yeah and uh and i also wanted to ask you um what was the name of that book that you said the voice it's in the, the vocation? it's called the voice in the vocation it's a pretty short book. and by, the vocation or it's in the voice the vo- in the voice in, in the, the vocation. vocation it's parker palmer who's written a lot of books okay uh eve probably you had to read a book for ceb about teaching it's i think it's a short little book i think it, it actually pulls a lot from like quaker thought Okay. Um, which is, I think, really, I think the Quaker, and I, I, I'm open to lots of different religious perspectives on lots of, and I think the Parker Palmer stuff is great because it's, it's interesting. His voice and vocation are both in the title, and it's about, you know, it's about finding the life that you that you're looking for, at, in, in like putting that at the at, at the forefront of your aim of like, yeah, like let's figure this out. And and I and I think when when Dharma practice takes on that kind of creative, imaginative tone, um, it just it, you're thinking outside of the box, and it's just it's just I just find it to be a lot more enjoyable than like grinding it out on my cushion, watching my breath fucking decade after decade. Like that's gonna do anything, <laughs> <laughs> which I've done, you know. Like I I, I mean I, I say all this stuff mostly because I mostly feel like a Buddhist failure. You know, like I, I've just like I've just totally, you know, like out of my own frustration and my own my own like this isn't working for me. I've always just had an appetite for for really, really wanting to understand, like, what what was the Buddha really trying to tell us? Well, and, I, and, and, and I just I've, you know, I just I'm, I'm, I'm sort of obsessed with that quest and that's and I and I'm and I enjoy every second of it. I'm happy to do that. Well, I just loved I love how you, uh, you know, make it so relevant and so practical and also the shared humanity, man, that I mean, we're shared going, humanity. We're all, yeah, you know, and the compassion, but the shared humanity, we're yeah. like, we're all really, it's in really the same true. boat and we're all trying to work and liberate ourselves, right? Literally, nobody's getting out of here alive, man, you know, <laughs> like, it's all going down at some point, you know? 
Yeah. So thank Light you. Up. Thank you, Claudia. I appreciate it. Any other thoughts, questions, reflections before I yeah, carry I, on some more? Yeah, please. Yeah. Man, I've listened to you talk about Sila so much, like through your Dave Smith Dharma podcast that you put out. And it's always really struck me as like just so dead on. Like it's such a, such a neglected part of the Eightfold Path. And that's always really stuck out for me how you have emphasized Sila being so important because that is that's really how you bring yourself into the world. That's that's the reflection of how you bring the Dharma to the world. You can sit and you know be on the cushion all you want, but how you you know how you present yourself to the world is through this that sila action. And I just want to say thank you, man, for for this and uh, just everything you've done, man. Like you, you, you've, yeah. <laughs> I appreciate <laughs> like, it, man. I yeah, do. man, absolutely. It I makes it all it. worth it at the end of the day to hear that. I'm like, oh, because especially with podcasts, you just put this stuff out there, and it's like, I don't know if anybody will, you know, I don't know. I don't, I don't have any, like, you know, so it's always good to, it's always it's part of the journey that I enjoy is like the, the trip of like people telling me that, you know, like, oh, you listened to it and you enjoyed it. And it's like, cause I just download, I mean, I'm, I'm a recording engineer by trade also. So uh, I'm good at this kind of recording and putting stuff out. So I'm, it's been actually funny that that vocation has actually turned out to be helpful in my Dharma teaching. I'm kind of a, a lucky person in that way where I've, most of the skills I've learned in my life, I still use in ways that didn't, that would not have made sense. Like I didn't get into recording engineering so I could learn how to like record decent audio for podcasts. Cause so much of the audio out there is garbage, right? You listen to like some of the talks on Dharma seed, you're like, you can barely hear the Dharma talk, you know? So I'm like, I was always like, at least I want my audio to be good. Even if my talk stink, at least you can hear what I'm saying, you know? <laughs> yeah, totally. So I, I can talk some more unless anybody else has any other any other questions or thoughts you wanna you wanna address and maybe after I speak some more we'll have some other other ones yeah please Tia I just want to say that I really appreciate and this is from listening last listening to last week on YouTube and then tonight again also like the the stepping away from the the all of the connotations and denotations of the word right like oh my god I really appreciate the i appreciate the perspective i appreciate um it's super appealing to me and it feels uh really uh uh i don't know it's it's a great opening to thinking about things in in ways that are more accessible and i really appreciate it thank you yeah well you know i'll talk more about that actually now because um why is my Zoom showing me two different things? That's okay. Um, because, uh, you know, I, I talk, you know, part of the reason I put this in the title is, you know, secular perspectives on the on the seal of path factors. And so what, what does that mean, right? I talked a little bit about that, but like, I think secular, again, is a, is a grossly misunderstood term. Uh, and really part of it, a lot of secularity is understood as a secular, but an ethical seal of way of thinking. And, and sort of like, I mentioned this before, but the three criteria is, that really rests at the idea of secularity is one is that whatever work we're doing, it is to improve the quality of life for everybody on the planet, regardless of their social, political, religious, sexual, racial backgrounds. Like that's really a secular way of looking at things. Of like we need to we need to improve the quality of life for everybody, and if we're going to trust anything, we should be trusting science not necessarily religious ideas or metaphysical ideas or some of these esoteric ideas. We're not chucking those out and dismissing those. We're just saying we have bigger fish to fry here. And the biggest fish we have to fry here is climate change, right? If we're going to improve the quality of life for everybody on the planet, we need to make sure there's a planet that's inhabitable. And so I think that, you know, and there's a lot, there's some work in, in the Dharma Buddhist world about that kind of thing. But then, then now all of a sudden action and livelihood start to become alive if we start looking at it from a social, political, sexual, racial kind of engagement, you know, socially engaged Buddhism, as oftentimes folks call it. Mostly what I've done in that domain has been around incarceration and addiction and working with people in that kind of space, which is, which is, I don't do much of that anymore because it's fucking burnout city. 
you know it's so hard to be in those spaces and then um the third aspects of secularity is it's is, is the general idea that it's good to do good that generosity is actually a value that's it's, it's actually good for me and it's good for everybody you know and and the, these are core if you look at like the birth you know what's his name george holyoke who kind of invented the idea of secularity in the late 1800s this is really the stuff that, that's at the core of it so it's not you know i'm not anti-monastic i'm not anti-religious secularity is not anti-anything in fact if you even look at another perspective on it uh the Dalai Lama, you ever hear of that guy? He's sort of the top of the food chain in the Buddhist world. He wrote a book called Beyond Religion. And the subtitle of the book is Secular Ethics. You know, the Buddhist Pope wrote a book on secularity. Like, that's pretty profound. And he, one of the things that he talks about that's a really a, a key dimension of secularity is tolerance. Which I believe tolerance is a function of metta. Can I tolerate your political views? Can I tolerate your the way that you see? Can I tolerate the fact that we don't see eye to eye on everything? And can I still value you as a human being, even though I disagree? How many people do you know can do that? That's like advanced practice. We think about advanced practices like seeing the true nature of reality or understanding emptiness or all this esoteric stuff. You know, you know what? deep dharma practices is being able to value the quality or the life of the person in front of you in which you maybe disagree on some huge big ticket items try that on for size try that practice that's hardcore and you know and, and then and then being honest about ways and areas in which we actually can't do that and not expecting that we should be able to do that all the time but holding that up as a kind of, and that's a feel of thing. That's, that's you know, uh, my, my core training is, of course, from a teacher named Stephen Smith, who really, uh, who grew up in Hawaii and learned a lot of his sila from the Hawaiian culture uh, and, and around speech and around action and around this stuff, not from his Buddhist practice so much, but it's, it's that core dana sila bhavana, the cultivation of generosity and goodwill, what the Burmese tradition calls sila brahma vihara, the, 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 that, that, that this, is uh, transformational practice. This is this is liberation practice. This is this is all of it, and that's really what Chitta Vimutti is: liberating yourself through these kinds of practices, and not being so preoccupied with the wisdom side of it. Of like, you know, and I think that as I think that we're probably mindfulness preoccupied in, in American Buddhism that meditation is really, really front and center, immediately followed by wisdom, and wisdom being reduced to a kind of understanding in a Western sense of knowing things. Knowledge. Uh, knowledge is not necessarily so good. Not, not all knowledge even values the concept of ethics. And so we really get limited in that way. So we have to be very clear. The Buddha is not interested in us knowing things. He's interested in us knowing how to do things. Dharma practice is a know how to game. Like, for example, I know that compassion is the, is the wise, appropriate response to my suffering and my pain. I know that as a Dharma teacher. You don't have to read too many Buddhist books. to, And I believe that that's true. And I know that. But when I'm in pain and when I'm in real suffering, do I actually know how to bring that to the table of the moment all the time? I definitely do not. I know that things change. I know and believe in the concept of anicca, of impermanence. I heard that at my first Dharma talk. I'm sure you did too. Knowing that, so when I'm actually in real change in my life or I'm in real loss, do I say to myself, oh, there's impermanence again. I'm just going to reacclimate to this. No. Do I know how to practice with it when it's actually happening? Sometimes I do. Sometimes I don't. And so, you know, as somebody who, you know, I'm not 
educated by any standard of what education means in a Western sense. Um, and I've always suffered from the, the kind of feeling that I'm not very smart. I've had some learning disabilities and like learning's always been really hard for me. Um, and so this other, this always felt so important to me like, well, I can, I can learn how to be kind and I can learn how to be, I can seal as like not trigonometry. You know what I mean? That's the thing about it that's so rich. You know, people want to understand the 12 links of the dependent origination or all these kind of, it's like, forget the, forget Dharma trigonometry. Why don't you just do the ABCs and the one, two, threes? Because that's where all the good shit is anyway. Right? And when, we, when we're dealing with, with, our, with our secular lives and our secular world, you know, these are the kind of practices, what I would kind of call off the cushion practices, which is mostly where you are. And so really trying to see a Dharma practice through this more uh, basic lens of, of, of speaking and acting and doing things and just, and how that feels. And when we actually do engage in generosity and we do engage in kindness and we do walk away from a situation where we go, wow, I really felt like I had my voice there. Feeling in the goodness of that. Another way to define sila is to drink in if to kind of drink that in and to take that in, oh, well, it, it, oh it, 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 it actually is good to do good. And it does actually feel good to do good. And so, you know, that's a whole different way of learning. Uh, that's it, you know, that's experiential learning. That's, that's really the core of emotional intelligence. That, that, that's the core of, of, of a lot of really actually secular ideas. And this is where I think that I, I, that's one thing I love about CEB. And that's why I started the Secular Dharma Foundation is I think that there's a, there's a really great uh, emergence in marriage between science and Buddhism, between secularity and Dharma that really, really can, um, hit home for us. I, I, I've been teaching this on these ideas a lot. I don't know if I read this to you last time, but I'll read it again because it's so good. There's a book called Destructive Emotions. You'll probably know this book, Claudia. You probably read it for CEB, which was a conference the Dalai Lama had in India in the year 2000 about trying to do all of this stuff. Let's bring the scientists in. Let's bring the uh, cognitive scientists and the clinical psychologists and, and, and the Buddhist meditators and the monks. Let's bring everybody into the room and see if we can figure this out. And this is what he wrote at the foreword of this book. And this is, this is the words of the Dalai Lama right at the beginning here. And he says, much human suffering stems from destructive emotions as hatred breeds violence or craving fuels addiction. One of our most basic responsibilities as caring people is to alleviate the human cost of such out of control emotions. In that mission, I feel that Buddhism and science both have much to contribute. Buddhism and science are not conflicting perspectives on the world, but rather differing approaches to the same end, seeking the truth. In Buddhist training, it is essential to investigate reality, and science offers its own way to go about this very same investigation. While the purpose of science may differ from that of Buddhism, both ways of searching for truth expand our knowledge and understanding. The dialogue between science and Buddhism is a two-way conversation. Buddhists can make use of the findings of science to clarify our understanding of the world and the natural world in which we live. But also scientists may be able to utilize some Buddhist insights as well. So, and all he says here, for instance, when it comes to the working of the mind, Buddhism has a centuries-old inner science that has been a practical interest to researchers and cognitive and neuroscientists since this has been happening. So really, Dharma is really a, a science of the mind. And, and that this is where this is where I just get super excited. And this is why I think Dharma practice is so bitchin'. It's like, you know, it's a science of mind that you can sit down and observe in your laboratory of your first person direct experience and verify for yourself. Like, you know, for the for like sometimes we hear early teachings, like we hear the five hindrances, right? We hear a teaching on the five hindrances. And then maybe in retreat we're sitting and we're like, wow, these five hindrances are actually really happening. Like this is like this shit's actually happening. And I can recognize it and I can 
change my relationship to it and I can ultimately liberate myself from the grip of it. But I think also too, we have to, we have to be very careful that we don't get in the slippery slope that that liberation or awakening is some destination state that we're going to arrive at. I think it's a, I think that we learn how to liberate ourselves so that we can learn how to liberate ourselves. You know what I mean? So you, you have to do, you have to just learn how to do that because you're going to have to do it like all the time. You know, and I think that that is really where we need to uh, remember, you know, uh, that this is really kind of of the work here. Um, and in a lot of, it's actually a really, I'm always jealous of people I find who are coming into Dharma practice now. They don't have to go through this whole annoying thing of having to relearn Buddhism or really unlearn Buddhism, you know, because I think that, you know, it's safe to say that when the Buddha died, uh, the original, not the original, but one of the Dharma paths, the one I'm talking about, Chittavimutti, where lay people were practicing the Dharma, probably around the time he died or very, very soon after, that kind of disappeared. Like, there's no lay Buddhist in parts of Asia really so much. Lay Buddhists are just people who give money to the monastery so the monks can practice. So when that happened, Dharma practice at some point became the religion of Buddhism. Right. And I love, and I also too, I have to say this every time. I love the religion of Buddhism. I am, I, I, I'm a fucking Buddhist fanatic, but I'm also not a monk and I'm not interested in becoming a monk. So I have to respect the conditions that I've chosen to live in and, and understand that like some of that understanding and some of that teaching isn't actually relevant to me. Money, sexuality, family, politics, climate change, racism, sexism, all this stuff is very relevant and important to me. And people who live in the monastery don't have to deal with this stuff because they don't deal with the secular world. You know, probably a good move, let's be honest. Let's be honest. <laughs> right? And so that's why I think that, you know, like, I, I, for me, the word Buddhism is, is, a, is a kind of world religion, something that you can study and understand. But Dharma is a whole different thing. Dharma is a practice that we kind of, uh, and you know, the, the Buddha says this in the canon, I forget where, but it really makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up and set. There's as many Dharma paths as there are people who are practicing it. And he even says, may, may, uh, may no two of you practice the same path. That was his wish. May not two people practice the same path. So everybody's Dharma path is actually quite different. And if we use the analogy of the map, we all have this Dharma map. We all actually have different versions of the Dharma map too, right? And then we take that map and we try to apply it to the territory of our lived experience and we do the best we can. And we can talk to teachers, we can, I can, you know, we can share with each other, we can Kalyanamita, we can say, well, how, what, what's on your map? And, and, and how has your map helped you with your territory? And I can say, well, here's my map and here's how it's helped me. And, and, we, and there can be active dialogue and we should be able to question these ideas. And the teacher sitting in front of the room shouldn't have all the answers and there should be no assumption that they do. There needs to be a dialogue. We need to be able to question like, yeah, this, this doesn't make sense to me or I don't, I don't, you know. And that's the problem with religion is there's an, there's an understanding and Buddhism's guilty of the two. There's an assumption that the person sitting at the front of the room has all the fucking answers and you don't. And that's destructive. That's patriarchy. That's hierarchy. That's a lot of just like, and so it's not really appropriate in a religious Buddhist context to tell the teacher you disagree or that they're, they're wrong or, or I don't see it that way. But you can do that in, you know, in, in a university class and educate, you know, in education. And this is what we do in learning institutions all the time. We, we question ideas. And I think the Dharma and practice, the Dharma understanding is going to do, is going to become much better if we kind of take this, you know, kind of Socratic method. Where, you know, somebody like me says, well, here's the Four Noble Truths and here's how, what it says and here's what I think. And here's an interesting framework like what do you think let's pull it apart let's 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 get in the mix on this and 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 get out of this kind of uh, let's get into a dialogue and that's really what i'm most interested in at this point is a dialogue uh and and yeah please claudia i kind of have i have a question and i kind of have a little bit of an answer 
myself, but I would really like you to elaborate. Sure. Because you were talking about like tolerance and the how to. And we yeah. know in the US and in Mexico has happened too that the country is very divided politically. Mm -hmm. And I have encountered in the town where I live uh, that people that were my friends um, are very conservative, I found now, and very religious and whose values and politics are very different from mine. And how to you know, respect that and accept that or, or, I mean, how to, is it like about finding what is the commonality? Yeah, I mean, I wish is I had it, an answer. I mean, I mean, I think that's, the, I think the question is the answer. Like, you'll never figure that out, but it's part of it is like, I don't have to respect or accept the ideas, but I can respect and accept the person. Mm -hmm. And that's where the teachings on 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 anatta and not self become very interesting. Where it's like, you know, I can find I can totally disagree and not accept and not respect some of your views. It's kind of like in in, in an emotional sense, I can be disgusted by some of the views that you hold mm -hmm. without having contempt for you as a person, right? And talk about advanced skills. Because I mean, there are people, and I and I have people in my life where we live out here in Colorado, like who's some of their ideas, you know, because we're, we're we're very politically divided here. It's a very interesting place. It's like the hippie redneck capital, you know. It's like, it's really interesting, and it's like I can disagree, I can, I but I, I but I can keep that to myself too. I can keep that in the privacy of my my mind and be actually appalled and disgusted and disagreed and think that I'm right and they're wrong. I can have all of that going on and I can still talk to them about sports and weather or whatever works, whatever's, whatever's, you know, the Dalai Lama talks about this. Every person on the planet has that part of their experience where they know even like you know, horrible people or mean people, they still have friends. They still know how to be friendly. Hmm. Everybody has that capacity. You know, uh, and so can we can we kind of tap into that with the people that we meet and, and take that on as a practice, as a as a, a part of my work is like, I'm going to try to and I do that all the time. I'm like, well, I'm like, where can I? Where's the friendliness in this human? And can I get in there and just kind of drop all the other stuff? And and, and if you do that, you know, then practice becomes uh, a lot more interesting. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was telling I tell this story, you know, I. I I have some friends out here who who do hold views that are way different than mine around you know, some of them are pretty strong too, like things around guns or politics or presidents and stuff and I abortion uh, yeah and I, I can still engage with them in a meaningful conversation and still be friendly and still actually value them as a human being it, but it's you know you have to be able to do both and you so that's 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 why the binary thinking is so horrible. And that word, I'm actually glad the word binary is getting the attention that it's getting in our culture now, because binary is the is the mechanism for polarization. And there is no right side of polarization. Do you know what I mean? That's the then that's actually why it exists. And so right and wrong again, you know the the Buddha is really trying to get us to see. He's not trying to you know the middle way is not the middle between polarization that's centrist that's moderate that's not what the goal is the, the middle way is not being in the middle of polarization it's being around it it's being bigger than it it's being able to hold it it's being able to see it for what it is and that's what equanimity is i can see the polarity i can see the tragedy and the beauty of this human life but i can see it for what it is Okay. I'm not bought in any part of that spectrum that I'm bought into. I'm out, now I'm out of equity. I'm out of right view. I'm not seeing it. I'm, you know, and, and a lot of people do, they want to be parked in the middle and they're saying, well, that's, that's the middle way. It's like, no, that's not the middle way. So when you're talking about being around, so a person that is like so radically different, from me, my values or whatever, but trying to see if you want the lights and shadows, the whole view of like, 
I don't want to refer to the good and bad, but I mean, the whole, is that what you're talking about? The whole yeah. being. The, and, that, and that's that word I like. I used to didn't like the word wholesome, but I liked it because it's whole. I can see com whole also means complete. Interestingly enough, the word sama is best translated as complete. Mm -hmm. So I can see, so I'm, I'm, I know I'm, 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 and it happens. I'm on the soccer field after soccer practice with my kids and I'm talking to this person and they're downloading their political polarized view on me. And I'm, in my mind disagreeing and being like, wow, this is a very unpleasant conversation and I'm having all this. And I'm standing there engaging with them, but I'm also taking in the sound of the birds and the sunshine and my feet in the grass. I'm actually able to, awareness can hold all of that. And I can just sort of say, I'm just in this experience right now. And, and, and there's this little kind of conversation going on with this person. That's a very, very actually small part of the whole experience that I'm actually having. Awareness can hold various epistemologies. It can hold polarized youth. Awareness, mindfulness can hold everything. But it's when we get sucked into the binaries or we, the conceptualization of it, that's when we start to get craving and reactive and greed and hate. This when we start to separate ourselves from the whole picture because we don't want to see it. And of course, it's so easy for me to say this right now, but you know, I, I don't do it all the time. I mean, it's like once in a while I do it. I'm like, wow, I'm doing that thing again. It's like not easy to do this, but I think if you can understand this as a concept, it can kind of make things more attractive. I'm like, what's going on right now? I'm in this conversation with person, but yeah, the, I can feel the warmth of the sun on me. I can feel my breath. I know that this conversation will be over in three minutes. I'll be back at my house with my family. And you know, it'll be it, this, this experience will actually be over, you know, and I can hold all of that stuff in, in mindfulness to bear something in mind. I can bear all, if I can bear all of that in mind in the intensity of that experience, the intensity of that experience actually decreases and it's not that intense because I'm not in conflict with the experience. I'm in cooperation. I'm in metta. I'm in sila. I'm I'm in the. I'm not bringing anything to the experience that's destructive. Now I might be. Maybe I feel like I'm being dishonest and I'm being inauthentic and all that other stuff. And that's all happening too, right? Like that's okay too. I might even lie a little bit and say I agree with the person on something to just kind of get through the awkwardness of that situation. And I'm holding that too. You know, how, you know, how big can, you know, and the bigger it gets, the better it is. It can hold, it can hold all of it. You know, and that's the power of the mind. That's the meditative power of the mind. It can hold all of that. Mindfulness can hold it all. But it's our habituations and our tendencies and our sankharic aggregates that are trying to fix and control and to change and to avoid and to, and we start getting into conflict with experience. And we, 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 we want the experience to somehow be other than the way it is, or we want the person to be other than the way that they are, because there's too many people that are like this. And, and then we just get into problem and solution and we get into dichotomies and we get into polarization and we get into papancha and we get into it quick and we get into it fast. And you're not going to be able to stop that. You know, you're just going to have to understand that that's also part of it here. And, and for me, Sila, Sila Brahma Vihara is the ultimate medicine here. That if I can be in that behavior, then all the other, you know, it's like kind of like it's dependent origination on steroids. It's like if I'm, if the quality of my experience is actually dependent on the quality of my heart in that moment, if I'm in that Sila Brahma Vihara, then all these destructive mental things, they actually can't arise in that field. Greed, hatred, and confusion cannot arise out of a field of Sila and Metta. It can only arise out of greed, hatred, or confusion, or can only arise out of defilements. So if I'm in that space, I'm using dependent origination to my advantage because nothing destructive can arise out of that space. So it's like the lowest common denominator. Well, just then just cultivate that space and you're good. 
because you know it, you know these destructive suffering reactive patterns can only arise if if the conditions are appropriate so don't bring those conditions to the table if you you know as best you can easier said than done but i, I think this is um tall order <laughs> yeah it's a tall order but uh, but it's actually not so much either at the same time you know that's the thing about it it's, it's actually i think it's a i think it's looking at dharma practice through a from a different angle from a more human angle. And I, for me, I, a more doable angle. I feel more encouraged and more enthusiastic. I feel more like, yeah, I think maybe I can do this. And whether or not I understand the ultimate nature of reality, I could care less about that shit. Emptiness is form, form is emptiness, all these big esoteric ideas. I have no interest in that stuff anymore. I just don't because I haven't found it to be helpful. Oh, we're a little bit past time, so I kind of went on and on. I appreciate the questions. Um, so um, thank you, everybody. We will uh, be back again, the same bat time, same bat channel next week, and I'll talk about, uh, so we're going from speech uh, to kind of understanding that as finding our voice. We're going from right action to trying to understand that as finding our work, doing our work, finding our calling. And ultimately here, this is Dharma practice. So our ultimate calling is the calling to be liberated. And then the last piece here, which we'll talk about next week, and I'll probably talk about it exhaustively as is my tendency, uh, about uh, not necessarily right livelihood, but how do we survive in this world ethically? which brings money right to the forefront. And so we'll, we'll, we can have, a, I think, a rich dialogue about that because Buddhists never want to talk about money. If I could deal with them every day, I'm str every day money, 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 time and money, man. Those are like the two biggest things I struggle with. I don't have enough of time and I don't have enough of money. And none of my Dharma teachers want to talk about it. What's going on here? <laughs> what did the Buddha say about time and money? You know, so we'll talk about that. Um, and I hope to see you all back again. I appreciate it. It's a lot more fun if the dialogue is rich. So I hope this was helpful for you and I appreciate y'all being here tonight.